last time we looked at a program which found out the maximum of five given numbers using an iterative solution. We specifically used a uh, statement called while. That while statement permitted us to specify a simple instruction which could be executed again and again and again. We shall be dealing with the while statement in much greater detail today, not from simply a perspective of understanding how while works, but of designing programs, which means designing while statements, how to write while statements, how to use while statement for iterative solutions. More specifically, since we are talking about a repetition, we must know what to repeat. So we will learn designing of the repetitive block. What is the block of instruction which must be repeated? Then we must know when the iteration must terminate. You will recall that in the sample program that we discussed last time, we had written while 1. In bracket we had written while 1. And many people were wondering what is 1. Because we have stated that there should be a condition inside those parentheses. Actually, one or any other numerical value is also a condition. As I told you, a numerical value of zero is considered to be false in terms of relational comparison. And a non-zero value is considered to be true. So when we write one, wherever a condition can appear, it means that condition is always true. So essentially, we constructed an infinite iteration that time. That is not the proper way. Whenever we seek iterative solutions, we can't have a computer go on and on and on doing those iterations infinitely. So we must understand how to build a terminating condition to terminate our loop. Finally, while the iteration is prescribed correctly by a block of statements which are to be repeated and the terminating condition is stipulated correctly, Still, there is one initial entry into that block. That entry happens when the statements prior to the block are executed and then you encounter the while statement for the first time. Now, at that point in time, there ought to be certain proper initializations done to ensure that the entire program works correct. So, in short, for any iterative solution, we have to worry about the des designing of the repetitive block, designing of the terminating condition, and designing the proper initialization. We'll also see more numerical problems requiring iterative solutions. Finally, we'll look at another way of prescribing iteration using some kind of a counter. There is another statement in C++ which permits us to define iterative execution a repetitive execution by saying, repeat this five times, repeat this thousand times, repeat this ten times. We shall see how exactly that specification is given. We will only look at a sample today, but we will discuss more details about that for statement and other associated variations of iteration in the next week. So we revisit the problem that we had solved and which you have seen in the handouts, namely how to find out maximum of five integer values. We had commented that we could, for example, just choose arbitrary variables A, B, C, D and E, read all the five values in these five variables and then assume the first value to be the maximum arbitrarily and then compare this maximum with each of the subsequent values changing max wherever required, if any value turns out to be greater than max. At the end of these instructions, I will just print out the max value. We had ensured that this program works correctly, but we had commented that if I have not 5 but 500 values, will I be writing 500 variable names? Will I be writing 499 if conditions? The program will become very unwieldy. But I do want to compare all 500 numbers if I have to find the correct maximum of 500 number. Which means I must have a mechanism of instructing the computer such that my instructions are small, but the actual work done is much more. 
Now that can be done if I have a mechanism to say that look here is a block of instructions keep on executing it repeated. The point is that instruction block will have to be identical but it must deal with different values in every iteration. How do we ensure that? So first we notice that although we are reading values in A, B, C and D and E, if the problem is of finding out only the maximum of given numbers, the identity of individual numbers need not be retained in my memory later. After all, I am just printing one value max. So whatever were the individual values, as long as I read them and I use them for comparison, it is okay. Consequently, I now see that while these instructions are similar, they are not identical. This one says B greater than max, max equal to B. This one says C greater than max, max equal to C. So I cannot take one instruction and just iterate around. So I generalize these instructions and observe that since I don't need these individual values, I can use the while statement. Incidentally, the while statement in C++ sets up an iterative loop of this kind. There are earlier statements. Then there is a while statement with condition. Then there is a block of statements which is to be iterated. There is an end of block. So while will always be written as a good practice with an opening brass and a closing brass. And this will be followed by the subsequent statements. These are the rules. The condition written in parenthesis is a relational expression. It is evaluated at the beginning of each iteration. And if the value of the condition is true, then this block is executed. So you can imagine the activity to be almost like if condition do something. So if the condition is true, this will be done. Otherwise not done is the implication in if. However, the difference in while is, if the condition is true, you will not only do it, but at the end you won't go out of the loop, but you will repeat that. So if the value of the condition is true, the block is executed and the control goes back to, the check, to check the condition. That is what causes repetition. Otherwise, that means at any time, if the condition is false, then only you will come out. So that is the implication of while. While the condition is true, keep on executing the block repeatedly is the mean. And it is not blind execution. At the beginning of every execution, check the condition. Obviously then, something must happen inside the block, which will change the condition sometime or the other. If the condition never gets changed, the block will become infinitely executed. And that is the reason why we have to choose this condition rather carefully. We now generalize our problem of finding out maximum of five numbers. We say we want to find out a maximum of large number of positive integers. We still assume positive integers. We will then generalize this problem further. But we say that I might give five numbers, I might give 20 numbers, I might give 200 numbers, 500 numbers. Now, I will ask you one question, okay, you will give me so many numbers, but when will you, how will you tell me that you have no more numbers to give? So we agree on a protocol that to my program you will keep giving numbers, since they are all positive integers by your definition of the problem, I will expect you to give a number zero at the end. Therefore, I expect the input numbers to be given one after another. Incidentally, when you say dot slash a dot out, after compiling a program and the program starts execution, that is the time when you feed input value because that is the time your C in statements are being executed. Now the way you give input values and the way C in statements are executed, they have sort of one to one correspondence between elements which are read by C in and the values that you give. So if you say C in greater greater A, one value is expected. C in greater greater A, greater greater B, two values are expected. C in greater greater A semicolon, sometime later C in greater greater B, two values are expected. The point is these values can be given, one value on a line, press enter, another value on a line, press enter, or you can simply put those values one after another with some blank in between. As long as the value does not contain a blank in between, that will be a single value. Consequently, you can give an input just as a single line like this. 25, 13, 47, 12, 92, 265, etc., etc. And when you are finished with your numbers, you can give 0. So this will be the input that you will give me. And I am supposed to write a program which will read all these values, find out the maximum amongst all values. Obviously, here the maximum should turn out to be 265. 
and we want to use the while statement in C++. So now we look at how we will construct this program. We don't have a ready-made program to look at. We had looked at a sample, but we are now going to construct a program. That means when we are designing, we are synthesizing something, we need to know what we must do to implement, to correctly write the while statement or correctly use the while statement. The while statement can be written correctly, but whether it's used is correct or not. Now that usage, as we saw just some time ago, requires three mandatory things. Mandatory is compulsory. You must design the repetitive block correctly, because that is the block which is going to be executed again and again and again. Then you must define a terminating condition properly, because that condition is going to be evaluated at every iteration. If you don't design it properly, you will end up in an infinite loop, or you may end up not doing anything at all, because first time it says the condition is false, you will get out. And finally, first time when you enter the while loop, you want to ensure that internally things are executed properly, all variables are initialized, etc. A job which must be done before the while statement is written. Because it is with those initial values that the while loop will be entered for the first time. Consequently, the third mandatory thing is to design initialization. We will look at all these three in the context of this problem of finding out maximum of so many numbers. So we recall the program which we wrote for finding out maximum of five numbers. We had this C in B, if B greater than max, max equal to B. C in C, if C greater than max, max equal to C and so on. What we were doing basically is that we are comparing a number with max and if we found it to be larger than max, we are assigning its value to max. Now that is the crux. That is the action which we are repeatedly executing. And therefore, we can think of the general statement of this guy. Not A, B, C, D, E, but just any number X. Actually, I could have written A greater than max also. I could have chosen any name. The name doesn't matter. The point is, I want to compare max with a value. And if that value is greater than max, I want to reassign max that value. That's it. This is the action I want to repeatedly execute. But a new value of x must be used in every iteration. I can't keep comparing x, same x with that value. Consequently, what I want to repeat is not just this instruction, but an associated input instruction which must be executed just before it. So I say what I want to repeat is, I input a value and compare that value with max. If that value is greater than max, I reset it. This is the block which I would like to repeatedly execute. Every time I come here, I take a new value, compare it with max, greater than max, reset max. If not, don't do anything, but go back again, iterate, iterate, iterate. You will agree that if I wrote these two statements as a block and repeatedly executed them, I could find out maximum as many numbers as I give as input. So we have designed the repetitive block here. We start writing a skeleton of our program. Since so far we have encountered two variables in our design, x and max, we just start with int x comma max. Then somewhere down the line we write, leaving some space, we write the statements which we want to execute again and again and again. C in greater greater x, if x greater than max, max is equal to x. You agree that these two statements we have written like that? And what I have shown here is an artificial boundary sort of just to indicate to us that this is a block of actions to be repeated like this. However, we note that we don't want to repeat it infinitely. That is what was happening in our earlier program, the sample program that we saw. We instead want a condition to be checked here at the entry point of this iteration, something like this. If x is not equal to 0, then only you do all this. Come back, again check if x is not equal to 0, then only do this. The moment x is 0, get out. Why x is 0? Because we have agreed that last value that you will give me will be 0. So I expect all other numbers to be positive integers. And when you give me 0, I don't have to do anything with it. I have ended, I have done all my work, I get out. So the condition of termination of iteration will generally be hidden in the statement of the problem. When do you want to stop? When do you want to terminate? And whenever you want to terminate, the negative of that will mean that you have to continue. 
So if at x equal to 0 you want to terminate, x not equal to 0 should be the condition for which you want to continue. So we have set up a terminating condition. First job, identify the iterative block. Second job, identify the terminating condition. Now we check whether any initialization is required. We look at the while statement of our program. So my program now will be while x not equal to 0, inside this block, c in greater greater x, if x greater than max, max equal to x, come out, there will be next statement. I do not know what the earlier statements will be, I do not know what the next statements will be now. Obviously the next statement is print out the maximum and finish off go home. What should be the initial statements? On the face of it I do not seem to require any initial statement because this repetitive block execution is adequately powerful to solve my problem. But we now examine that if we did that, for the first time when this iteration is entered, is everything working all right? When the block is executed for the first time, several values are undefined. Imagine when you are coming here, earlier statements are doing nothing significant. Now when you come here, first problem, while x not equal to 0. Now what is x? We don't know, we have not initialized it. Please note that x would be read inside the block and therefore subsequently x will have a proper value. But when I come here for the first time, x is indeterminate. I do not undefined. Now it may so happen that the previous friend of yours who executed some program left 0 in a location which got assigned to your x. So the moment you get in, oh, x is 0, get out. Nothing will happen. You don't want that. So you want, you notice that this is one problem. What is the other problem? When you come in, you are comparing x greater than max. What is max? We don't know. Suppose max was set to some 2 to the power 30, not a number which you are giving in that range. What will happen? The first number that you read, x will get compared with that number. In all probability, you will get that arbitrary value as the maximum. So we notice two things. Initial value of x is not defined and initial value of max is not defined. Now please note, this, we are not just analyzing, we are also understanding the construction mechanism. We are learning design. And what is the design principle? Once you have written a block, once you have written a while statement, go through all statements in the while block, including the condition, manually one by one. But do not look at what would happen in a dynamic equilibrium when the loop is executing, just concentrate on what happens for the first time. For the first time x is undefined, for the first time max is undefined. This is what I should notice. And obviously I must do something about it by initializing them to appropriate values before the while statement is entered. That means the earlier statements which I have indicated here ought to correctly reflect the appropriate initialization of x and max before I enter the loop. Here is an attempt. After all, what is required? What is required is ultimately I am going to read a number here and if I am giving 20 numbers, all each one of those 20 will be read. They will be compared with max. So I really do not need the, uh, uh, my number uh, game is properly played. What I need x for is that initially x not equal to 0 is what I am testing. So let me test x to some value. How do I set x to what value? Can I set x to 200? No, because if I do, then all my values, if they are less than 200, I will get chewed up. So I must set x to a value which is not likely to occur in your input numbers. Then only I can guarantee that it will not affect the correctness of my algorithm. Now since we have said finding out maximum of given positive integers, we know negative numbers will not happen in your input. And we also know that every positive number is greater than a negative number. Consequently, if I set x is equal to minus 999999, arbitrary, some negative value, then it will ensure two things. One, when I come here, x will not be 0 and therefore I will execute this block. And second, it will not impact the correct determination of max. 
because every value that I read actually from you will be greater than minus 9. Consequently, I decide to put this. But I should write a comment saying that x is set to some negative value arbitrarily. Second, I have to initialize max I have noted earlier. What should be the max initially? Again, it could be any negative number. It could even be 0 because all values that you are going to give me are positive values. So I could have said max equal to 0, I could have said max equal to minus 10,000, minus 1, whatever. I might as well set x, set max to the same negative number which I have put here. Again, this is an arbitrary decision and this is the point in designing algorithms and designing programs. For a given problem, there is no unique program as a solution. Each one of you can write a variation which may be different from others. We shall later on see how do you distinguish between programs, whether can you define some programs are better than others and so on. In the lab this week, there are some problems and some pro example programs given which force you to think and compare different programs which do the same thing but they are written differently. Here is the case. So is this, is this understood? <coughs> if I did that, then the flow chart for this program would become like this. Notice I am starting with x equal to minus 9999 and I am setting x to max. So max is set to that value. First time when I come, x has a value. Is it not equal to 0? Yes. So I come out here, read the input value for x. Okay. Note that initial value now is obliterated. The moment I read, x gets a new value now, which is the first value that you are giving me as input. That value gets compared with max. Again, since max was a negative number initially, the first value itself will change max. Because any value that you give, since it is a positive integer, it will be greater than max. It will be true. You will come here and you will set max to the first value. After that, you will go back again. If this value is, let's say, 12, 12 is not equal to 0, you will come back again. Read the next value. Let's say it is 5. Max would have been set to 12. Is 5 greater than 12? No. You will come back. Again, go back. The current value is 5. Is 5 not equal to 0? Not equal to 0. You will come in, read the third value and so on. The moment you have read the value 0, the moment you have read the value 0, it will come out here. Is 0 greater than max? Most certainly not because max would have been set to one of the positive integers that you have given so far. Nothing will happen to max. You will come out here. But now x is 0. And this is the time you will terminate the loop and come out. Agreed? So this solution seems to work. So what we have seen is not just analyzing how while statement works, but understanding how to use while statement to construct programs. Because that is the, that is the part we will be doing all the while. We will be writing programs to solve a problem. Here is an iterative solution. This is a complete program. This, this program, these slides will be put up on the web both on the course homepage and Moodle, so you can look at these later. Now, do you make sense out of this program? Because this is not a program which has descended from some example. This is a program which we have constructed right now. We write include IO stream using namespace std and int main as usual without understanding the implication, but we take it as gospel truth. The C compiler will figure out what it is. The main program that we have written is int x max, x is minus 9999, max is equal to x. While x not equal to 0, see out, enter the next positive integer in bracket 0 to end. Notice an elaborate string which has been written. Incidentally, this is the string constant. 0, 5, x or any such thing that you write here less than, equal to, etc. are not interpreted by your C compiler at all. I have stated this earlier, whenever in C out statement you write double quote and write any crap and write another double quote, that entire thing is completely ignored by the C compiler. C compiler is not going to look at inside what is there in this string. But whenever C out statement is executed, this string will be faithfully reproduced on your monitor. So this is essentially a mechanism for you to Make sure that your program gives you appropriate messages when the program is executed. This will happen at the execution. You will agree that this is a more appropriate message 
then just saying give number. So it is saying give next positive integer and zero to n. So it also suppose you write this program and give it to somebody and he doesn't know how to end the program. He'll keep giving the numbers and he will just wait saying, Abhi, what should I do? I have no more number. This is an indication that zero should end. Anyway, and then inside this block, I input this x, x greater than max, max equal to x. Notice a slight difference from our design to the actual program. In our design, we had only said c in greater greater x if x max max equal to. This c out statement is actually a further elaboration of the c in statement. So the c out statement should not be considered as a separate thing. We are merely helping ourselves to give the correct end. This curly bracket closes this opening curly bracket. Please note as I said, all brackets including parenthesis or curly brackets are matched from innermost to outermost. So this corresponds to this, this corresponds to this and this corresponds to this. You must have matching brackets in your program, otherwise the compiler will actually get completely confused. You agree that this program will work correctly? Please note now that this program, the number of lines of code that we have written, how many lines does this program contain physically? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 line program. It is capable of finding out the maximum of 5000 numbers, 20,000 numbers. We have now figured out a way where we have very precise and small set of instructions but which can make the machine do far more work than what the instructions specify. Indeed, <coughs> without the ability of specifying iterative actions like this, we will not be able to write decent programs to solve large problems. I will just leave this thought with you for a better initialization of our while statement. What we have so far done is we have assigned some arbitrary value. What is the justification for using this? No justification. The justification is Baba, we wanted to start with some non-zero value of x. But we also did not want it to be some positive value, otherwise it will interfere with my maximum finding. So I had put some negative value. Can I be more meaningful than that? Now one possibility is that look, I have been given some numbers. Why not I read the first number and treat that as maximum? And in the iteration, I start with the second number onwards. If I did that, then I will have no arbitrary initialization. In fact, my initialization will consist of reading the first number and assuming it to be maximum, assigning it to max. Since first number is unlikely to be zero. Why? Because if you had no numbers, you would not run the program. No? If you are running the program, that means you have some positive integers to compare. So the first number will be non-zero. Again, it is unlikely that you want to find out maximum of one positive integer. It is quite likely that you will have a large number of numbers. Therefore, it makes sense to start initialization with the first number itself. So, we read the first number and assign it to the value of max and our iteration will now take care of input from the second number. If we did that, then the initialization instead of saying x equal to minus 9999, I will say c in x and max is equal to x. You agree that this will be a more appropriate initialization. With this, my program something becomes like this. So I have the same program, define x and max int, but observe that initial values for x and max. Now this time we have changed my comment here in blue, which says first number is read into x and max is assigned value x. Observe that what I have written here for the purposes of illustrating and explaining what I am doing, it is a good idea to include these th statements as comments in your program itself so that any reader of the program can understand why you are doing what you are doing. So and notice also the slight difference between the message for the first input I give as compared to the message for subsequent inputs which will be repeatedly executed. Later on I am saying enter the next positive integer 0 to n, but first time I say enter the first number. It is more appropriate. I could have said that also. I need not have said anything, the input statement will collect a number. These are merely making your program more decent 
for the person who runs that program and who has to give the value. So you agree that this program will be a better version? Again we see that this is a different program than the other one although both accomplish the same thing. The exact number of times the individual instructions are executed will be different. For example, in the earlier program x equal to minus 9999 and max equal to x initially executed had no relevance. Those two were extra instructions which were making the machine do merely because we wanted to initialize things properly before entering the while block. Whereas these statements actually are part of the work to be done. To a very minute extent then I can claim that this program is more efficient than the previous program because it makes the computer do two assignment statements less. Not statements, two assignment, execution of two assignments are less in this. Okay, so we'll just note this, it does not really make a difference because when you are executing your program it executes in less than one second either way. In fact, the computer spends more time waiting for your input because you have to search on the keyboard, type in and so on. This is the flowchart. While you have all agreed that this program works correctly, when I put this up tonight, I would urge you to look at this flowchart execute this program with some different values, particularly with different initial values and see whether it actually works or something else needs to be done. Here is another modification for your consideration. I read the first number all right, but I first check if x is greater than max, then I set max equal to x and then I read the x. So I read the x just before going back so that the new x is uh, checked and only if that value is less than uh, not 0 then I come in. The advantage of this modification is that if the last value is 0 then in my earlier program the 0 actually gets compared with max. Okay, if you go to this earlier flowchart, if the last value is 0 that 0 is compared with max. Of course it will not be greater than max so no harm will be done. But Actually, strictly speaking, the moment I get a zero value, I should not do any more work. I should terminate. This does not affect the program execution for the problem that we have stated, namely finding out maximum of positive numbers. But suppose the problem was find out maximum of all non-zero numbers or find out maximum of all numbers except zero or whatever. Then when the zero comes, I should not be comparing it because if I give you all negative numbers only, zero will be more than the maximum. Just think about this, I will leave it to you to ponder over this and consider whether this modified version is better than the earlier version. Also think whether you can further modify it because as I said, there is no unique solution or a unique program for solving a problem. And anybody and everybody of us can actually think of a stratagem which will make this program better. That's the beauty of program. Next we consider a different problem, a computational problem which requires iterative solution. It is known as a newton raphson method. I will spend some time in explaining this problem and solution also and will construct a program. This is an iterative method which helps us to find a root of a function fx. Now given any f of x you know what root means. If x is the root then f of x should be 0 at that value. That much is known? Fine. Now the general algorithm to solve such problems numerically. We are not doing integration, differentiation, any such thing. We are just trying to solve it numerically. Numerically the way the problem is solved is you start with some initial guess. Let us say xi. Calculate f of xi it will obviously be non-zero. If it is zero, I found the root. Now, starting with that xi, find out the next approximation. Call it xi plus 1. And again calculate f of xi plus 1. Obviously, you must do something that if, let us say, fx, if, if xi was say 25, then fxi plus 1 should be say 12 or 13 fxi plus 2 should be 2.5, it 
it should approach 0. When you calculate the function, that is how you will go to the root. If you have found out a mechanism to approach 0 appropriately, and then if you execute these iterations again and again and again, you will probably be able to find the root. So this method works if fx and f dash x is calculated. What, why f dash x? Well, as we shall see, the method of determining xi plus 1 for a given xi depends upon our ability to calculate f dash x. We shall see that in an example. So if we can calculate f dash x, and fx of course is a given function, if we can calculate both of them, and a good initial value is available, then this method is supposed to converge towards that root. Example is to find square root of k. k is a given number, 217.4. How do you find out square root of 217.4? Use a calculator. If you did not have a calculator, how will you find out? Use log tables. If you did not have log tables, what would you do? Well, you would do variety of things at Newton's time when calculus itself was not just invented by Newton. The, based on the newton raphson iterative numerically computational thing, this method actually traces back its history to the solution proposed long time ago. It says we will use this function fx is equal to x square minus square. Since we want to find out a square root, Okay, we use this, this is an artificial function, but you will notice that the result, the root of this equation, okay, will give me the square root of k. Because this means that where the function is 0, x square is equal to k and therefore x is equal to under root k. So, if I find the root, I have found out square root of k. We said that we should be able to calculate f dash x, it happens that f dash x is simply 2x, so therefore it can be calculated easily. Notice that while calculating f of x and f dash x, I require just two or three arithmetic computations. So I can compute both of them straight up. I now need a good initial value. It so happens that in this case, initial value x0 as 1 always works. Now this can be proved independently, we are not dealing with a math score, so we will continue with this assumption. But let us see what successive iterations do to us. How to get a better xi plus 1 given some xi is the problem. So let us imagine that xi is this, this is my function. Obviously this is square root of k because that is the root. In fact, the whole graph will move leftward or rightward depending upon that k. Okay. If k is 0, where will this graph pass from? Origin, fine. So I start with some arbitrary value and I have reached through my iteration some place which is let us say xi. How do I determine the value of xi plus 1 which is my next iteration but which is closer to the root? So here is an example. First of all point A which is actually this point has coordinates xi comma 0, okay, xi is the distance from origin and it is on x axis so y coordinate is 0, so point A is known. Now I determine f of xi. This f of xi is nothing but value of this function at A and consequently if I plot this point B, then I know the value of the coordinates of point B. The value of x coordinate of point B is same as this which is xi. The value of y coordinate of point B is f of xi because that is the value that I have calculated. Agreed? This is straightforward. So I know now the point B coordinates. Now I say that this function, which is actually a complex function, I approximate this function by the tangent that I draw here. I imagine that tangent is that function. If I did that, then let us say the intercept on x axis, which happens at this point, I call this point C. Now, if tangent is representing this function, I can find out, I can calculate the tangent at this function. That is where I need f dash x because f dash x will give me the tangent. And therefore, I can calculate this c. Now, this c is the new point which I want to go at the next iteration. And this c point, 
I designate as x i plus one. As of now, I don't know what is x i plus one, but I know x i. I know f of x i. I can calculate f dash x, and therefore I can calculate x pi plus one by observing this form. What is f dash x i? It's like tan theta, which is a b upon a c. The value of a b is f of x i, and the value of a c. Is x i minus x i plus one? That is the difference. Consequently, this implies that x i plus one is simply equal to x i minus f of x i upon f dash of x. This is where the maths knowledge comes in handy, so that I can calculate given an x i. How to calculate x i plus one is known. With this knowledge, can I use the while statement? To iterate successively here, 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 and go to zero. But I notice one thing. Earlier I was dealing with positive integers, where zero had a specific distinct identity, and I was only comparing things. Here I'll be doing divisions, additions, etc., etc. Am I very sure that I will get exact zero ever? Very obviously, I'll be using floating point numbers now. Since I cannot get exact zero, I must decide. To stop my iteration at some value which is close to zero. Noting that now I start my construction of while statement. Remember what three things I have to do. First, I have stated the problem: find the square root of a given number k. So I start with f x equal to x square minus k. I note that f dash x is 2 x. And I note from my previous mathematical analysis that x i plus one is given as x i plus k upon x i entire thing by two, because this is the this is the formula, f of x divided by f dash. X. So when I simplify, this is the notation. Now I am saying I start with x zero equal to one, and when I put one into this place, one plus k upon one. Divided by two, I get the next value x one, and then x two, and then x three, and so on. So now I identify the repetitive block. Again, like in the last problem, I need not remember the previous x i, x i minus one, etc., etc. My job is to find out where I am currently, and from that determine the next value. So consequently, I identify the repetitive block to be simply x is equal to x plus k by x by two. Agreed? This is the current value of x. Using the current value of x, I use my formula to determine what should be the next value. So, in any iteration, I come in with some value of x, and this will help me calculate the value to be used for the next iteration. And I keep doing this any number of times. We shall see when we look at the termination condition. But this is what we have to do in any iteration cycle: take the current value of x and compute a new value of x for next it. Next, we come to Criteria for terminating the loop. Now we have said that we can get as close to the root, which is square root of k, as required. How do we define a closeness? I already commented that when you are doing floating point operations, it is dangerous to expect exact zero to be reached. And therefore, we define some tolerance. We want to reach as close to the root as, say, within plus or minus 0.0001. Which is good enough for most of the engineering and scientific solutions, or so we presume at the moment. In which case, at the root value, f(x) will be exactly zero, but we want to terminate when f(x) is within this. Please note there is a slight difference. It is not necessary that the root which is calculated is exactly within this. We are saying that f of x at that point is within plus or minus 0.00. So we define a termination criteria: terminate when absolute value of f of x is less than this. Otherwise, keep repeating. Here is what I have stated again. So this is the curve. Notice that this is the root. If I say I should find the root within plus or minus 0.00001 or whatever, I am actually telling you a tolerance on the x-axis. But I have no way of finding that out because I don't know the real root. The only thing I can find is the value of the function at any given x. So I define the tolerance in terms of function of x. 
I have drawn two lines here which define some kind of an accuracy threshold which happens to be 0 0.0001 here. If that is the threshold then my terminating condition is when absolute value of f of x becomes less than or equal to this get out and therefore my continuing condition is not of this. So if the value of this absolute value of this is greater than this I must continue iteration. So I got the termination criteria. I got the iteration block, next is initialization, initialization was one, this was the simplest of the problem because the fellow who told me the problem said start with x not equal to 1, it will always work, I have a theoretical proof for it, good, thank you very much, I do not have to waste time in designing. Now this is the program, so look at this program, it says float k, float x equal to 1, initialize. Some people were asking me, should I not write 1.0? Please remember that you can write the numbers as you please. When they get assigned to the variables, depending upon the type of the variable, the value will be appropriately converted before assigned. The only thing you have to be careful about is when you have two operands of the type integer, the result is an integer and division could create a problem. So you have to be careful about it. Anyway, so this is the initialization. Give number whose square root is to be found, there is an error here, I will correct it later. I read k, notice that this is not part of my initialization of the iteration, but this is the necessary initialization, I must read the value of k whose square root I want to find out. Okay. The real initialization for the iteration is just this, x is equal to 1. Fine, so I, I have done this initialization, I have read the value of k, observe the condition, while while x square minus k is greater than 0.0001 or two vertical bars or k minus x into x is greater than 0.0001. Why this complicated condition? Because it should be within plus or minus 1. And the value of fx at any point x could be either positive or negative, we don't know. So therefore, we take cognizance of both possibilities. Later on we shall see that there are built-in functions which will permit us to calculate log x, sin x, absolute value of x, even square root, etc. But we are studying how to do this using algorithms, so this is all. You agree then this condition is proper? As long as this condition is valid, I want to keep executing the iteration. Iteration is simply x is equal to x plus k by x by 2. So, given an existing value of x, calculate the new value of x, go back again, check this condition, go back again. Do you notice how simple the program is? The entire complicated method of calculating by slide rule or by lock table or calculator or whatever, step by step, is taken care of just by few, the, few of these instructions. That is why this is an extremely powerful mechanism as we said. The value of the root is whatever x you have found out at the end, that is it. You can have additional modifications even in this small program. For example, one of you may say that look, why should I restrict a general program, powerful program like this to always calculate root up to only this particular accuracy. Let user define the accuracy instead. Let somebody say that I am okay with 0 0.01. Somebody else says no, I want plus minus point. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, Somebody may say I want the tolerance to be between plus or minus 1.0 e minus 12. I want that accuracy. Let user decide. Well, if I want to include such a possibility, what could I do? Simple. I could define another variable float t, let us say, for threshold. Input the value of t. And wherever I have used this absolute value, I will say compare it with t. And I will run on that tolerance. The only difference will be smaller the tolerance, larger will be the number of iterations that will be executed. But let Dumbo do the Godagiri, why should I worry? All that I should worry about is that my iteration actually terminates sometime or the other. So is, is it clear how to use while? You will be constructing programs using while statement in your next lab. You will not be using other statements in the lab. However, we will continue discussion of alternative ways of prescribing iteration. To that end, 
we shall look at the need for an alternative form and we'll only look at a sample of a program which employs an alternative version of iterative specification called the for statement. Just as we saw the while statement in the last class but we discussed it here, similarly we'll only see the use of for statement today and we'll discuss its usage, the designing, etc., etc., in the subsequent class. Here is the need. If I want to repeat the iteration a given number of times, notice that in both the problems, how many times I want to iterate was not known. What was stated is find out maximum of given positive integer. Find out value of the root within this range. But there are problems where I want to do a specific thing. For example, the very first problem we solved, it said find out maximum of 5 given integers. Somebody may say find the sum of n given values. n is not known at the time of writing programs. So suppose somebody says, look, I have some values, but I know how many values there are. I have 563 students. I will give their marks and you have to calculate the average. But 563 is the total number in CS101. Let us say three students are absent. So at that time, the marks that I will have will be 560. The point is, I want you to write a program for me where I will tell you how many marks I am going to input and you calculate the average and give it to me. So my problem then is, given n, do something n times. That is my problem. Similarly, a question, add areas of thousand rectangles with different dimensions. Why would one do such a silly thing like this? Thousand rectangles of different dimensions, different height, different width, calculate one area, second area, third area, add thousand times. Well, we shall see a very meaningful problem in the next class when we discuss estimation of log of x using a method of calculating sum of areas of differing rectangles. But such problems do happen. In such cases, what we need is a counting mechanism. What is that counting mechanism? We want a mechanism which will start with a prescribed initial value, say count is 1. Then we need a mechanism that in the iterative, I am talking in the context of iterative solution zone. So I have found out what is to be iterated upon, but I want this iteration to be done fixed number of times, n times. So I want some count to be set to 1. Then when I iterate, every time I iterate, I want that counter to be incremented. And whenever count reaches my maximum value, I want to come out. In short, I do not have any other terminating condition. Other than that, that look boss, keep counting how many times you are doing things. After you have done it 10 times, get out. Please note that I can implement this specification using my while statement. What can I do? I can set a variable, say count. Before the while statement, I initialize it to 1. Suppose I have to execute it n times, then I will say while count less than equal to n do this. And inside the iteration block, at the end, if I say count plus plus, at the end of the iteration, count will be incremented. And when I come back for the next iteration, that count will be compared. So I can easily implement it using y. I therefore do not need any special statement in C to do, let me do this. However, if I know how to do this, then I, it would be nice if I have a concise single statement where I can specify all the three things, initial value, terminating condition, and increment. <coughs> Such is the for statement. C++ provides a statement to implement such iteration control. So this is an example. For, in bracket, count equal to 1, <coughs> semicolon, count less than 5, semicolon, count plus plus. Notice that what is written here is not a condition as we wrote in Y. It is a very complex specification. There are actually three statements. First statement defines initialization. Second statement defines a condition during which time you have to iterate. And the third statement says what is to be done at the end of an iteration. So exactly what you had imagined in your mind that you will do using a while loop. You will initialize outside the while. In the while you put a condition for continuation and at the end of this you will increment one by count. That is precisely what is stated. 
what is to be remembered is that while the for statement is written in one shot you prescribe all of these three things these three things do not happen at this point in time when you execute the program this is a specification mechanism there is a block the statement is in the iterative block however when this statement is compiled the translated program works as follows it initializes the count before beginning the first iteration that is this statement is executed before the first iteration then at the beginning of each iteration it checks the condition that is more like your while set and additionally after completing these statements within the iterative block it introduces an action which says increment the count at the end of every all that this means is it's an extremely simplified neat and elegant mechanism of doing counting without having to use your while state i will just stop by giving you an example of an iterative solution for finding out maximum of five numbers int x max count max is 0 please note that in this case i do not require to initialize x why because my while condition does not depend upon x being 0 my while condition says do it five times in fact you don't even have to give me an artificial zero at the end i am guaranteeing that i will add five numbers so i start with max equal to 0 i have to initialize max because max is a part of comparison here so i am still adding five non negative zeros a uh, non negative integers look at the specification for count equal to 1 count less than equal to 5 count plus plus notice a very meaningful usage of the increment operator it does not matter whether you write plus plus count or plus plus and remember that this specification says that when the program is translated count equal to 1 is executed somewhere here then you come inside check this condition is count less than equal to 5 of course initially it is because you have set it to 1 and then you execute these statements go back but before going back count plus plus is executed somewhere here i would urge you to think of writing down a flow chart representing this for based on this explanation we will be discussing and using for in many numerical problems in the subsequently